Hello everyone, this is Savannah Betkowski, Project Assistant at the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. On behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar entitled, Completing an Energy Audit, What You Need to Do on Your Own. I will be providing some technical support for today's session. Please take a moment to observe your GoToWebinar control panel. Most of the functions are self-explanatory, but I'd like to draw your attention to the question section on your control panel. During today's session, you will all be kept on mute to ensure audio quality and minimize background noise. Should you have a question, please type it into the GoToWebinar question dialog box at any time. We will be holding all questions until the end of today's presentation to ensure that we end on time. We have over 110 registrants for this webinar today, so we will try to get to as many questions as we can. Today's presenter has consented to share their presentation slides with you and will make the slides available as well as a video recording following the webinar on the EFCN website. You can reach that website at efcnetwork.org. Please allow one week for the processing and posting of these materials. To give you all an idea of where others on the webinar are tuning in from, we have prepared this map. You can see that we have attendees spread across throughout the entire country. Thank you all for joining us today. This session is one of several webinars conducted by the Environmental Finance Center Network for smart management of small water systems projects. The EFCN provides training and technical assistance to small public water systems in all 50 states and five territories to help local water systems achieve and maintain compliance with the Safe, water, with the Safe Drinking Water Act. Here you can see the various centers that make up the Environmental Finance Center network. And you can see that the centers are spread all across the country from New York to Kansas to California. And here you can see the areas of expertise that the Environmental Finance Center focuses on. Workshops, trainings, and direct assistance are provided on asset management, energy management planning, financial management, leadership through decision making and communication, managing drought, water loss reduction, collaborating with other water systems, financing, funding problems, managing small utilities during drought. Before I turn the presentation over to our speaker for today, I have some polling questions for you. The first question is, what kind of drinking water utility do you represent? Please choose one. For-profit water utility, local government, not-for-profit, another water utility, or not a drinking water utility. As you can see, the majority are not from a drinking water utility or from a local source. The second polling question is, what size drinking water system does your utility operate by number of people served? Please choose one of the following, very small, small, medium, large or very large, or not a drinking water utility. Again, the majority are from a drinking water, not from a drinking water utility, or from a very large or large utility. At this point, I will turn the presentation over to our speaker for today. Here with me today, I have Dawn Nall, Program Manager at the Southwest Environmental Finance Center. Dawn, welcome, and please take it away. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. I hope that you're all having a good day today. Um, I am going to get started with a question for you to consider. Should a small water utility care about energy management? Well, I think so. And the reason why is that if you look at this pie graph, you can see that 
a large majority of a typical water utility's budget is wrapped up in their energy costs. So wouldn't it be nice if you could make that slice of the pie smaller and spend some of that money somewhere else? Some other reasons that small water systems should care about energy management. Here are some statistics that show you why. Uh, how much electricity costs are for pumping water at small systems each year. So this is just for pumping. What would it take for your water utility to reduce the electricity consumed by 10%? And if you reduce that by 10%, how much would you save? So how do you know if you can benefit from investing some time and effort into energy management? NYSERDA has created a checklist for energy savings, and there are a couple of links here that you can find um, different resources, and the checklist is one of them. So the first link I show is EFC Network's resource library. That's the very um, general link where you can find resources on all of the various topics that we offer. And then the next link is the specific link for this checklist in particular from NYSERDA. Whenever you look at the checklist, it asks questions about different groups of, um, or of assets. And depending on how you answer, you score points. And if you score up to, uh, five points or more, um, then it's very likely that there is potential for energy use reduction in your facility. So you can kind of see here, these are the first groups of questions. This is the second group of questions. So you can go through and answer yes or no, um, and it scores the points, and you can determine if there's potential for you to save um, or to reduce your energy use, in turn, saving money. So who is NYSERDA? It's the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Um, they were created in 1975. They've done a lot of great work with water and wastewater utilities um, in New York State, but their materials um, are publicly available. We find them to be very useful, user-friendly, um, and that's what we kind of have based our trainings around. So NYSERDA um, defines energy management in seven basic steps, and we wanted to let you know that as part of the step two, we've developed a new um, baseline tool, and it was presented in a webinar just a couple of weeks ago, so that information is available to you if you weren't able to attend the webinar in person. Um, it should be posted at the website, which is at the bottom of every slide that you'll see today. Um, so take advantage of the tools that are out there, and developing baselines, understanding your energy bills, things like that. Today, we want to focus on step three. Um, and completing energy audits or assessments. And I think that it's possible for small water utilities to complete their own energy assessments, and today I hope to help you understand how to do that. So first, I'd like to have a poll question. Have you ever had an energy audit or assessment completed at your utility? And I can't see the poll results because I have my PowerPoint on top of the screen. So if you guys could help me out with those. So it looks like the majority are have never had an not a water utility, no, and then yes. Perfect. Thank you. So hopefully by the end of today, um, by the end of the webinar, you will have a feeling that you can do your own energy assessment. And the next time we ask that question, the answer will be yes. So whenever we start looking at energy assessments. There are several areas that you can evaluate, um, and you will want to look into energy use, determine when and how it's used for areas including raw and finished water pumping. Pumping is typically your biggest energy consumer. Your chemical mixing, depending on what type of mixers you use, you might be surprised by how much energy they're consuming. Um, for the small metering pumps, maybe not so much, but if you have some of the bigger mixers, um, you know, it, it might surprise you. Dawn, this um, is Laura. Sorry, I'm just going to cut in for a second. It looks like sure. you're having some issues with your slides. 
um, it is stuck on the polling question. So I am going to just quickly take over and then make you the presenter again. Just want okay. to, you know, so. All right. You should be able to share. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much, Don. Sure. Sorry about that. Other areas that you would want to consider, uh, backwashing your filters or other um, treatment areas, your wells, if you have any ozonation or ultraviolet disinfection, um, both of those are large energy intense treatment processes. Um, other things that you would want to consider is load shifting. You'd want to consider your distribution system and how you're getting water to the various areas and pressure zones in your distribution system. If you have SCADA or not, if it would be worthwhile to invest in a SCADA system. Um, and then do you use energy efficient motors? Also, it's important to understand the tie between energy efficiency and water loss. If you're treating and pumping water that isn't being sold, but it's actually leaking out of those pipes, you're throwing money away in so many areas. So AWWA has developed a water loss audit spreadsheet, and the EFCN has developed a guidebook that helps walk small systems through that process. Um, so we've had webinars on water loss. We've had trainings throughout the country on water loss. There's lots of information available on that website listed at the bottom of the page. So if you have concerns about water loss, um, conquering those and energy management kind of at the same time, they, they definitely go hand in hand. So when you're thinking about doing an energy assessment or energy audit, um, it's important to understand that there are some differences between the two. Um, so when you do your system walkthrough and you're recording your energy using assets, uh, you're essentially collecting the data needed to perform um, like a level one or a tier one energy assessment. So you're not going to get into the depth of looking at what's your building insulation what's your air conditioning, your heating, your HVAC. Um, you're not going to look at compressors. and You're going to look at the equipment that is used to generate clean water. So that's the walkthrough that we're talking about doing today. So what do you need to prepare for your walkthrough? Well, before the walkthrough, there are several things that we want you to do to prepare. Um, of course, we want you to define who will be part of your energy team. We want you to discuss your goals and deliverables of doing energy management before you do the walkthrough so you have in mind um, the purpose, um, what you desire to accomplish. And then develop a schedule. When is it appropriate to do the walkthrough? Um, and what kind of personnel will you need uh, to have present when you do the walkthrough? You also want to collect data. Um, Gather all the available information about your energy using assets before you walk through the plant. And you will not probably be able to track down everything that's on this list. And you probably don't have everything that's on this list because this list includes things for groundwater systems and surface water systems. But as you look at the list and you consider what do I have available, what can I get a hold of, that will help you look for things that you might not have um, but you might find in the plant itself or the operator writes down in a, a book that he keeps with him in his truck or whatever it might be. So think about the data that you need, um, gather what you can, and then maybe make a list of what you don't have so that you can start to collect it as you go. A couple of other tools that would be helpful to you before you go out into the field um, are your rate schedules. So looking for your energy utility rate schedules. What are they charging you? Also looking at energy bills um, and understanding what you charge your customers, so the water utility rate schedules as well. Um, so just having those handy, looking at them, being familiar with them will help you in the process. And then, of course, before you walk through, Think about the tools that you want to take with you when you go through the plant. Sometimes the name plates on equipment aren't visible, or maybe they're not really easily accessible. So will you need something like a ladder, a broom, um, you know, there might be spider webs or dust or debris that <laughs> gets in the way. Um, and if lighting isn't great, you'll likely need a flashlight. 
a camera is very helpful for record keeping and for getting into tight places where maybe your head can't fit. So um, making sure that you have a, you know, a cell phone does a lot of things um, for us these days, the flashlight and the camera all in one. So making sure you're prepared before you go through the plant. Then when you're, you have prepared and you're ready to walk through the plant, there are certain things that you want to gather, um, the data that's most important. So you want to make sure that you're collecting the nameplate horsepower. And I find it really valuable to take a picture of the excuse me, take a picture of the equipment and then zoom in on the nameplate. So you've got a permanent record of exactly what you saw in the field. You want to note any interesting, important operational information. Um, is this pump used for seasonal purposes? Is this a variable speed pump? Um, do we pump against a throttled valve? So why would those things be important? When you're looking at energy use and energy consumption, if it's a seasonal pump, you need to understand that. So when you're looking at averages, you understand what season um, and what charges you are, are facing. Um, some electric utilities charge different rates in the winter than they do in the summer. Uh, if a pump is variable speed, has a variable speed drive, or is variable frequency drive, um, it will impact how much energy that particular asset is using. And then if you're pumping against a throttled valve, you are essentially taking a pump that's oversized, throttling it down with the valve. So you're using all of this energy to move all of this water, and then you shut it down with a valve. So knowing that you're pumping against a throttled valve will help explain some of the energy consumption. Uh, and also, you want to make sure that you understand runtime information for each asset. So how many hours per day is it running, or how many hours per month or year is that pump running? Um, and so there are different ways to gather that information. Sometimes we're recording it on daily log sheets. Sometimes we know that when the well turns on, the chlorine pump turns on. So if we have runtime records for the well, we can essentially assume the same runtime records for the chlorine pump. Um, so different ways to gather that information. But oftentimes, talking to the person that runs it is the best way to get a feel for how often um, each day that pump or motor is running. So here are just a couple of examples um, of what you'll be looking for. So first, you want to take a picture of the overall equipment, so a big picture of the pump, the VFD on this pump. And then you want to find the nameplate. So on this particular pump, it was convenient and easy to see. On this particular pump, it was up against the wall. So I stuck my phone back behind there and snapped a picture of it. But what you're looking for specifically on this nameplate is this horsepower rating. And it's not always in the same place, depending on the manufacturer. But it's usually near the top, um, one of the first items on the list. And that's what you want to make, make a note of, make sure you know how many horsepower. Um, and obviously, this nameplate is not from that pump. So <laughs> it's a much larger pump than the nameplate I took a picture of. And then as I was mentioning, um, the runtime data might be on a daily log. So make sure that you have access to that information, that you, um, if it's not logged into a computer, that you can get copies of it made, or that you take a picture of it before you go, so that you can use it in inputting data and calculating averages. So now that you've collected all of that data, how do you interpret it? Well, first, we want to make sure that you're collecting all of it into one place um, and that you're getting at least a year's worth of data. And you can track it in whatever way you find best for your utility. It can be handwritten. It can be electronic. It can be in a table or a spreadsheet. Um, but I highly recommend a spreadsheet. It helps you do the calculations. It helps um, make sure that your math is correct. So uh, you can um, get a lot of information into one spreadsheet and not have to have uh, lots of places that you're going to reference. And if Excel is not your best friend, you may want to ask for some help. So some suggestions for who you can ask help for. Um, people in your finance department are likely familiar and comfortable with using Excel. Um, 
sometimes high school classes or community college students programs are able to help you to develop a spreadsheet to um, start something out. And a lot of times they'll do that at no cost for you, um, just as a, as a class project or something of that nature. So the data that you've collected in the walkthrough um, should be input into your spreadsheet. And the, the information that you want to make sure you put in there, you want to make sure that you give each asset a unique identifying name and ID number. You want to make sure that you've gotten the horsepower, the nameplate horsepower documented. Uh, and again, the pictures can come in handy here if you um, need to double check. And also you want to note if the pump or motor is using a variable frequency drive. If it does, um, it will affect the way that you do your calculations. So your horsepower reduction percentage is equal to the frequency reduction. So just be aware that if you're using a VFD, um, it will impact the way that you calculate your usage. The average runtime, make sure that you get that into your spreadsheet. And if it's um, documented daily, you're want, going to want to average that over the course of a year. So every, um, all of that data that you see on a, on a daily log sheet or a monthly report, you want to get into the spreadsheet and average it over a year. Design specs, if we don't know what the pump is currently pumping, um, what the flow rate is, look for what the design was intended for. Um, and it could come from pump tests, from well logs, from the documentation that came with the O&M manual, um, places like that that you can look. And then the operating status. Um, when you were in the field uh, and someone said, oh, we alternate pump one and pump two, they never run at the same time or we have three pumps and we run them lead lag spare. Um, so make notes of that so that you, as you're looking at your energy costs, you can understand maybe why one's running more than the other and is that really what's best for your utility. Then you start getting into your calculations. So you want to make sure um, that you've got your spreadsheet set up. Um, the first thing that you're going to do is convert that nameplate horsepower to kilowatts. And it's a simple multiplication. You take the horsepower, multiply it by 0.746, and that converts it to kilowatts. Then you want to take your hours of operation per year, and that comes from your average runtime. So if you had hours per day, you want to get it to hours per year. Um, so that can be a simple either direct input or a simple conversion to go from hours to years. Then you want to take your total kilowatt hours per year. So you're going to take that first one, the kilowatt, calculated power, and multiply it by your hours of operation per year. Then you need to look at energy costs. So you're going to take your energy bills and your energy rate schedule. Your rate schedule might say that you're being charged nine cents a kilowatt hour but there are probably other fees and charges that go with that. Demand charges, peak charges, uh, seasonal charges, you name it, there's different charges in all kinds of electric bills. So I think that it's better to use an average energy cost than to use your rate schedule. So if the rate schedule says it's nine cents a kilowatt hour, chances are when you add in all the other charges and fees, it might be closer to 12 cents a kilowatt hour. So I think that it's advisable to take a year's worth of energy bills. Your energy bills will show you how many kilowatt hours you were charged for, and then of course the total dollar amount that you have to pay. Um, and if you average those out over a year, I think that's what's best to use in your calculations. Then your total cost will be your total kilowatt hours per year multiplied by your average energy cost that tells you how much it's costing you to run that particular asset over the course of one year. Um, and this information becomes pretty valuable in looking at how you're running your plant, why you're running, which pump you're running, those kinds of things. And then the last thing that we want to do is take that total cost and divide it by the flow that it's producing. Um, this is about the only way to compare apples to apples. So if you want to look and see what each pump is costing you, 
um, because we run them differently and we have different flows that go through them, dividing it by the total flow allows us to see what it actually um, costs per million gallons. So this is a, the point in the spreadsheet where you really get some good information and some good results. This is what an example spreadsheet looks like when it's all said and done. Um, I did different energy assessments last year across the country, and this is one from Iowa. So you can see um, we have the asset name, we have the nameplate horsepower, we noted if it's variable speed or not. Then we start calculating the kilowatts, how many hours per year it's run, multiply those together, that gives us our total. Um, we made some other notes in some of the fields, like I mentioned, and then we get that average cost um, per kilowatt hour from our electric bills, our total cost, and then our cost per million gallons. So you can start to see one well costs more than another. Uh, does it make sense to run well three more than well two? Would we save some money? Would we not? What's the quality of well three? Is it worse than well two? So we start to get some, um, some good um, questions to ask based on the information that we see. So this is just kind of a zoomed in view. I took out a bunch of the columns so that you can kind of see a little bit better um, that you're going to go from horsepowers to kilowatt and kil I'm from horsepower to kilowatts and then from kilowatts we use our run times, our energy costs to get our total cost. So this is just a zoomed in view simply to show um, kind of what your, your goals are. I talked about averaging data um, and the information that you collect in the field or that you collect in the office. So this is an example of calculating your average run times um, for each piece of equipment and this is using Excel. So we had a monthly total um, hours for each well and each high service pump. We added them up for the course of a year and averaged them out. And then we use these average numbers um, in our spreadsheet to look at the, the total hours per year. This is an example of calculating your total flows for one year. So again, we had monthly data. We put each month's information into the spreadsheet and we let the spreadsheet find a total for us. And this is an example of your energy data. So I, I said that your electric bill will show you your kilowatt hour usage and the total cost of the, uh, the total price that you're paying. And this includes any charges, demand fees, things of that nature. Divide those two out and you get your cost per kilowatt hour and then average those out. This is a two year average versus a one year. Um, so, but we definitely recommend one year as a minimum. So what good is all of this data? You've got it in a spreadsheet, you did all this math, and so what? <laughs> now you can use it to help guide your energy management planning. So here are some of the categories that you might want to consider when looking for energy efficiency. You want to determine the total cost of using each source. The unit cost, this is what we talked about, figuring out the cost per million gallons. Um, and then you want to know the limitations of each source. So whenever you are looking at, well, well two is a lot cheaper to run than well one. Does well two have the capacity that we need? Does well two have the same water quality? Do we have the water rights for well two? Oftentimes, um, things might be, might look good on paper, but we need to understand the limitations and why we're doing things the way we're doing. So using the lowest cost water first, um, I think maybe I jumped a slide. I didn't jump a slide. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, and then you want to understand the additional cost of using more than one source or pump station at once. So if you are starting two pumps at the same time, you will have a higher peak demand than if you can um, start one pump and then wait the period that the utility, the energy utility charges for peak, and that could be 
15 minutes, it could be 30 minutes, it could be an hour. Um, but if you can understand what those additional costs are for running more than one source, more than one pump station, um, it will help you to, to reduce your costs. And then having prioritized source operation plans that maximize the use of the lower cost water. Also, in using the lowest cost water first, um, it's helpful if you automate your operations so that the lowest cost water is prioritized as much as possible. Making sure that your PRV settings, your control settings, um, the set points in your tanks um, are not causing you to use your high cost water over low cost water. Keeping your high cost water where it's needed and maximizing the use of the lower cost water in the areas of the system where it can be used. So if you have multiple pressure zones, if you are pumping water up um, to a storage tank with a high lift pump, um, but maybe not everybody needs to have water from the tank, maybe the water could, some of the water could come from the wells directly um, for the people that are at lower elevations. These are the kinds of things that we're wanting you to look at and consider how much is it costing you to run those pumps and is there a way to reduce it and is there a way to use the less expensive water first. So this is one example of where we think that we're running something um, as efficiently as we can, but then when we start looking at the numbers, uh, we realize that maybe we are not. So we have two wells, they're in the same well field, um, so the water quality is the same, the water rights are okay, we could essentially run either well to fill the tank. Um, and we typically run well one, because it's the larger pump, it fills the tank faster. So the tank set points um, give us seven feet of operational room and the tank diameter is 30 feet. So when we look, that's a total fill volume of 37,000 gallons. So if we run well one, it takes us 83 minutes to fill that seven feet. If we run well two, it takes us 160 minutes, almost double um, the time. But because well two is smaller horsepower, we end up using less energy to fill the tank with well two than with well one. And if we look at it over the course of a year, it costs us $4.03 to fill the tank with well one and $3.90 to fill the tank for well two. If we have 400 fills per year, the difference in, this, in the cost of running well two versus well one is $52. Does that mean we should never run well one? Well, probably not. Does that mean that we're saving a ton of money by running well two more often? Well, the $52 may not be the overall big picture because we're using this average energy cost of 13 cents per kilowatt hour. It may actually save more than $52 a year because our demand charges may decrease when we're using the lower horsepower pump. Um, if we can run during off-peak hours versus peak hours, if our electric utility charges such things, um, that can save us more money. So um, this is a very beginning picture that shows that our assumption that always running well one and having well two for a backup was the best way to go may not have been the best assumption. So just something to consider when you start looking at the numbers. So when you're looking um, for energy efficient opportunities, there are several different areas that you might want to consider. So you want to consider definitely um, capital programs or equipment replacement, but sometimes these are very high dollars. So replacing a pump with a more energy efficient pump may be a good idea, but it may not be something that we can do this year or next year. It may need, need to be part of our five year plan or our 10 year plan. Um, and then the process change, these are typically very low dollar um, changes that can save us money. So like in that previous example, if we switch from running well one to running well two, um, we can save some energy money that can go elsewhere. Operational changes, 
um, kind of the same thing, typically low dollar, but help us to save some energy costs. Automation or controls, um, this will help us to just be a little bit more efficient in the way that we are starting things, the way that we um, look at the data, the way that we understand the data, maintenance improvements, and then business measures. So just different categories to consider. Whenever we look at water utilities across the country, um, we know that there are many opportunities to reduce energy consumption while maintaining the quality and maintaining or maybe even enhancing productivity. Um, but where and how much energy can be saved varies by facility and it can't be really predicted by some kind of formula because every facility functions within different constraints. So energy consumption varies among systems depending on many different factors. So the age of the facility, the types of components they have, the type of tre treatment being used, the topography. Um, if you're in an area with lots of elevation change, your costs are probably much higher than someone who's in a very flat region. Whether the utility uses surface or groundwater sources, the size of the system, also the geographic area of the system. So this table just lists different factors um, that affect energy consumption in the water supply systems. So when you're considering energy management projects, there are some um, that will have a higher impact to your utility than others. This list shows some potential high impact projects for you to consider. So optimizing your water system, making sure your pumping systems have high efficiencies, understanding your motors, using a motor management software, um, promoting water conservation in your utility, reducing your heating and cooling load for your buildings and well houses, and possibly using renewable energies. So when we look at promoting water efficiency and conservation um, on that list, there are a couple of different ways that you can promote water efficiency. So you can promote it through, with your customers through price um, and also through non-price measures. So there are different ways to encourage conservation, low flow toilets, low flow shower heads, um, but also charging more for the, for the higher use. The more a customer uses, the more a customer pays, helps promote um, conservation. And then at the utility itself, reducing your water loss um, obviously increases your water efficiency uh, and reduces your electric bill. So um, there's this direct link between conservation and energy um, savings. There are several different types of renewable energy available. Um, you have to consider your utility and what might be right for you. Uh, I've been to several different water plants that are using solar. Um, we've talked to some that are using micro, micro hydro. Um, there are systems that are using biogas at their wastewater plants uh, and of course wind. So all of these renewables have different costs up front. Um, and cost savings over time, and um, definitely something to consider as you're looking at um, improving wastewater or water treatment plants, um, upgrading them. So, um, and also the communities are looking at renewable energy sources, so you can purchase wind energy as opposed to um, a non-renewable. Some other areas to consider that don't directly affect your water production and you haven't necessarily looked at during your assessment, but will help you reduce your energy consumption. Reducing heating and cooling loads for buildings and well houses. How can you do that? Um, you can insulate the buildings. You can make sure that you have high efficiency equipment. You can make sure that you're using the right type of um, heating and cooling for the building that you have. Take a look at your lighting. Um, how is the lighting in the building? Do you have maybe eight panels of overhead lighting, but you really only need the one over the desk um, most of the time, and the rest of the time, you, um, if you're repairing something, it would be nice to have the rest of the lights 
um, maybe installing an extra switch um, and some wiring to make it so that you don't have to have all of the lights on all of the time, but just the ones you need. And then behavior change, making sure that you're switching lights off when you leave the building, making sure that the thermostat isn't set um, for a nice cool 65 in the summer, but maybe 75, <laughs> uh, things of that nature. And then looking at things like dehumidifiers, um, how you're running them, do they need to run all of the time, could they be unplugged at night versus daytime, um, you know, just how are things how are things that aren't specific to the water system operation being used and can they be used differently to save some money. So as I mentioned, I've done a few um, energy assessments every year. I've been to several states and territories and um, done the assessments with the utilities. Um, in fact, I just completed the assessments in New Hampshire this year. and. Um, Every year, it's interesting. I learn a little bit more about what the utilities face in conserving energy. Um, but I wanted to give you a couple of examples of things that maybe we wouldn't consider had we not done the assessment. So this particular utility um, recently built a brand new plant. And when they built, they opted to switch from propane, a large propane, propane heater, to small electric heaters that were installed throughout the roof of the building. Um, and when we completed the energy audit and when we looked at their baseline energy use information, it became very apparent that they were spending more money on heating than probably anything else. Um, so their costs to generate the water were not very high, but their costs to heat the building um, that they used to treat the water increase their cost significantly. So they want to evaluate alternate fuel sources, see if going back to propane, they also had natural gas on the street um, right outside of their plant. So they had uh, several different options. They were also considering um, looking at solar for heating. So just um, evaluating the alternate fuel sources to heat the plant and then determine what's most cost effective because it, it seems that electric is probably not the most cost efficient way to heat that water plant. So everything else in a brand new plant was pretty energy efficient outside of the heaters. A second system, um, whenever we completed the walkthrough, you could t might be able to tell it was in a cold, snowy region of Colorado. Um, so when we completed the walkthrough, um, it became apparent by doing the audit that the system was pumping um, continuously, but their population was largely seasonal. Uh, so this indicated to us that their pressure zones maybe weren't sufficiently isolated, um, that maybe they were pumping in circles, or that they have a significant leak somewhere in the system, or they have a lot of very small leaks in the system. Um, that are costing the system to run the pumps constantly, continuously, even though there's not the customer demand. So the system plan to first investigate their PRVs and their check valves, make sure that their pressure zones are isolated, and then begin looking into water loss reduction efforts to help reduce um, their energy consumption as well as their water consumption. So next I have another poll question that I'd like for you to to answer, would you like to complete an energy assessment at your utility? And if you're interested in completing an assessment, but you're concerned about the amount of math, how do the spreadsheets work, the EFCN network can help. Uh, we are able to provide one-on-one -on -one technical assistance to small systems as part of this cooperative agreement with EPA. So you can request that we assist you. If you collect the data, we can help you do the math. Um, and you can do that by going to our website, which is listed right at the bottom of the slides. Can you guys let me know the results of the poll, please? So the majority were not from a water utility, and then the 35% voted yes. Great. Thank you. So at this time, I'd like to open it up to your questions, and um, you guys 
can ask me by typing into the question box and we will do our best to get through as many as possible. So do we have any questions today? Yes, we do. The first question, energy audits are classified as level one, two, or three. When you say energy audit, what level are you talking about? Level one is a walkthrough. Level two is an actual watt measurement tracking and summarizing data in a written report with actual data. Again, what level are you talking about? For this particular presentation, I'm talking about doing a level one walkthrough assessment. Great. The next question is, are the spreadsheets you use available? The spreadsheets that I use are not available with calculations in them. Um, because each utility is unique in calculating those averages, um, every time that I do an assessment, the tabs in the spreadsheet become unique to the utility. But the table itself that um, showed that I showed you the results um, for the system in Iowa, that table is available. Um, it's part of our asset management and energy management guidebook, and it's available in the appendix. That manual is available for download from our website, um, and you can print them out. They're Word. I think the tables are in Word. You can add your logos. You can modify them. Um, you can convert them to Excel. And of course, if you're interested in having assistance with the Excel information, again, um, you can submit a request for help, and we will um, you know, be willing to help you out. And I'm willing to share spreadsheets. They just won't always fit um, each utility uniquely. Wonderful. Now, just a reminder to everybody on the call that you can send questions that you have through the question box. Before we get ready to wrap up, I do have two more polling questions for you. The first question is, would you like to subscribe to the Environmental Finance Center blog? Thank you. The following question is, if you are a small water system, 10,000 or fewer people served, would you be interested in receiving in-depth technical assistance? Yes, no, or if you would like more details. Thank you. Also at this time, I am pushing out a link in the chat box. This is a survey for today's webinar. If you have a chance, please take some time to tell us your thoughts about today's webinar. You will also be receiving a follow-up email tomorrow with the survey link as well as the link to the slides and recording. Again, please allow a week for processing these materials. Oh, all right, and I do have a few more questions. Great. How is the small system that you audited in Colorado how small is the system that you audited in Colorado? What is the name of the community? Um, I won't share the name of the systems. I haven't gotten permission from them to share all of their specifics. Um, and I just don't, you know, don't want to upset anybody. So, um, but the system was um, a very small system, a seasonal system. Um, and they were going through some um, challenging changes with operators and there were lots of questions at the time um, about how, how things were run and if they were being run properly. So um, identifying if those pressure zones were in, indeed isolated or if maybe one of their PRVs had failed um, would be very valuable to them in energy savings, water savings, um, and in the way that they um, you know, the wear and tear on their pumps. And I have one more question. For a small utility that has not conducted an assessment or audit, is there a range of savings that can be expected? <laughs> I think that starting with the NYSERDA checklist to see if you answer or if you score with the five points or higher is probably the, the best thing for a small utility to do. Um, 
since our utilities vary so much, um, especially for our small systems, um, a system that's uh, two groundwater wells and a storage tank and its gravity distribution, and the wells are relatively new and probably more efficient um, than a well that would be, or a pump that would be 20 years old, there might not be a lot of potential to save. Um, but if the well pumps are older and you're looking at maybe switching to soft starts and, um, uh, you know, like a premium efficiency winding or something of that nature, then there might be potential for cost savings even for a system with just a couple of pumps. Um, and then for surface water systems, um, for systems that have lots of high lift pumps or not even a lot, but to have high lift pumps, um, there's a greater potential for savings. For systems that know that they're pumping against throttled valves, there's a lot of room for um, possible savings by eliminating throttling that valve and, and um, looking at maybe a VFD or a smaller pump um, that would be more appropriate to the system, uh, system's needs. So, I, there's not a, a standard number that I can tell you, yes, you'll definitely save $2,000 a year, $20,000 a year. Um, I know it would be nice if we could go to our board members and council members and say, we need to do this, it's going to save us $5,000 a year. Um, but we can help, say, you know, kind of take an initial look at how many energy using assets you have, take that um, quick NYSERDIC um, questionnaire and then kind of have an idea that yes there is room for potential savings and hopefully that's a good selling point to starting down the road of energy management. All right, we have a question from a property manager of a sizable community who wanted to find out if you can help with the math or give guidance as to what she should be putting on the spreadsheet to perform her own self audit or do you only assist with utilities? We can help um, any small system serve that serves fewer than 10,000. So um, as long as you fall within that serving fewer than 10,000, we're able to provide assistance at no cost as part of this particular agreement. All right. I believe that that is all the questions that we have right now. Thank you, Don, so much for a very thorough presentation. It was extremely interesting. Would you do you have any last thoughts? Right, well, thank you guys. All right. Thank you, Don, so much.